Shabbat Shalom, everybody. This is Rob Shmuel, Rabbi Stephen, with this week's Divine Torah. Parsha Shoftim. So first, Mazel Tov and congratulations go out to Colin Roth. Colin, congratulations. Colin uh, went through the Beidin and the Mikvah. He uh, has completed his requirements. He's now uh, become Jewish by choice. So congratulations to you. And uh, here's hoping for many more. We have people who are involved in the Miller course that will go through the same process. We have some, uh, also some uh, young folks that will, are looking to go through it as well. So uh, very excited about that. Uh, very excited about uh, the choice that you make. So we are, gosh, uh, a month away from the high holidays. We're going to start reciting Psalm 27, a psalm for the penitential season. That's going to be part of our liturgy. So, uh, wow, time flies, doesn't it? Anyway, uh, let's now get into this week's portion. Shoftim v'shotrim, you will make and your land. So these are judges and officers. So now we're getting into setting up courts, a system of courts. Now, uh, this is really the first time we had a hierarchy of sorts, of the courts. So, of course, you all know we have the Bay Dean, which literally means House of Justice. It's, you know, three wise men, or in our case, in our time, three wise people. Yes, men and women. Not going to get into the whole gender thing. <laughs> okay, in Judaism, there's two genders, uh, men and women. So I'll leave the rest of it up to you. Um, and also, Shotrim, these are officers of the courts. Okay, so we have the level of courts. We have the Beit Dean going up to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is a group of 70 wise men. Again, wise people. Let's be politically correct here. And respectful. Respectful. It's not just about being politically correct, folks. You know, there's, there's this issue in Judaism about men and women. You know, we've talked about, you know, in the morning bracha, you know, conservative Judaism has changed or altered the blessings a little bit. But, but uh, traditionally... The prayer for men, as we all know, was, was, made, was not made me a woman. And uh, for the woman, they would say, who has made me according to your will. So it, it's not a negative on women. It's just that men have more things to do. We have more commandments to do. One of them is adjudicating courts. Okay, why? Because women have the highest responsibility in our religion. Maybe I should say higher because there's only two, right? Three, you have highest. Two, you have higher. Okay, so they have the higher responsibility of taking care of the house, the household, and raising the children. An awesome responsibility to raise the children in accordance with our Torah. Just as this particular portion says that your judges should be wise men who are not able to be swayed by bribes. Remember, we talked about that when Jethro came and after Moses brought the children of Israel through the Sea of Reeds, after Hashem parted the ocean, he said, why, why, why are you adjudicating yourself? Why don't you set up your level of courts? Here we have the commandment that sets up the system of courts. Now, there's been some discussion among the sages that Moses erred in setting up these courts because being the prophet, being the foremost and really kind of the only prophet back then, it was up to him to adjudicate all the cases. However, I wonder just how that plant pays pans out with this commandment now that sets up the system of courts in the land. So we have the Sanhedrin, which is the court of 70. It's kind of like our Supreme Court. It's the highest court. And the 71st member of that court would be the high priest in case of, of course, you know, ties and everything. Once the Sanhedrin has determined a case, and they have determined the law. It is illegal. It is against Torah for someone to come and start preaching against that ruling. Now, you can disagree as much as you want. You can disagree during the deliberations. That's fine. But once the court has spoken, that's the way it is. If you want to teach and you want to say, you know, they decided this, but I kind of disagree. It is still incumbent upon you to go with that ruling because the Sanhedrin has, according to biblical process, gone through that procedure. 
if you look at the Torah, they set out specific laws and specific processes to, to, to take God's law and apply it. We also have in this particular portion, and you consider it a flow. I'm real big on the flow of the Torah, how it plays out, what the sequences of our laws, because it also, this portion also talks about false prophets. Even if you have a valid prophet who has been talking about God's will and God's law, and all of a sudden says, well, you should do it this way now. And this way that they promote is not part of God's will. That prophet has lost their ability, has lost the respect as a prophet. You are not to listen to them. Now, there are some prophets like Elisha that have deviated you know, in, in times of emergency, but they're not deviating from God's law. They're just I'm giving you a different way to go about things. Ultimately, it's still God's law. So we do not deviate from God's Torah because, as Moses said, God's Torah is complete. It is perfect as it is. You don't go to the left. You don't go to the right. You, know, you don't add an extra blessing to the priestly blessing. You, know, you only have the two to fill in, arm and head. You don't decide to put one on your leg or, your, or the other arm, too, or whatever. Okay, That's, that's the law. And it's up to us, it's up to the judges, and it's up to the officers of the court that go off and get the witnesses, that gather the evidence in order to carry out God's law. Now, interesting method of adjudicating. A case is not decided unless you have two witnesses. You need two witnesses, especially in a capital offense. A capital, you know, that's capital punishment. That's, you know, eye for eye. It's the only time when it's actually life for life. Otherwise, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, that's all financial compensation. Only life for life. If somebody willingly lays in wait and then murders somebody, is that life to be taken? Now, and you need two witnesses in order to, to find the person guilty. Now, let's say either you don't have two witnesses, you have one witness. Sentence is not carried out. Now, the Torah refers to that person as a dead person because even if the court does not find them guilty, Hashem will. And maybe they will die by karate, which is you know being cut off, and the sages interpreted that as an early death. Whether it's age 50, age 40, whatever it is, you know, whether they don't have children, whatever it is, God will carry out the ruling if the earthly court does not. Also, if you have two other witnesses that come and say, wait a minute, those witnesses are wrong. We saw what happened and we know, or we didn't see what happened, but we saw that at the time that the witnesses say it happened, those witnesses were not there. We saw them over there. Guess what happens to the witnesses? They incur the punishment that their testimony would have incurred for the defendant. So, if that defendant, if the punishment would have been 39 lashes, then the witnesses are delivered 39 lashes. Here's the real kicker. If it is a capital punishment process, then those two witnesses are put to death. Now, that seems pretty harsh. And it's one of those things where the sages say it was never carried out. Just like other situations that supposedly were never carried out, like the wayward son, never happened. Okay, but it's in there as a warning because this is very, very serious. Your testimony, you're testifying against somebody who is liable to incur the death penalty. So your testimony has to be absolutely scrupulous. So we have, uh, so you see the importance of setting up the courts. Now, the highest authority in the land is going to be the king. And God says, you can have a king. You can. You may request a king. Actually, you really kind of are supposed to request a king. Now, here's the interesting thing. The Israelites said to the prophet Samuel, we want a king just like the other nations have a king. Okay, what do you mean by the other nations? Well, God said we can request a king. Yes, to have a ruler because in the time of judges, when Israel didn't have a king, things were chaotic. It was a loose confederation and the battles that happened, you know, the, the Philistines would attack one tribe over here, knowing that the other tribes may not get involved. So you needed kind of a king to unify everybody and prepare for battle. 
But the problem with that is when the people said, we want a king like everybody else has a king. And who did they get? Saul, who wasn't, who started out great, but then kind of deteriorated. And we saw what that happened. A king should be wise. All right, and then it was David who was anointed by Hashem. So different king. Now Solomon, okay, that's another issue. Kings are said, don't have too many horses, don't have too many wives. It will distract you from your kingly duties. Solomon thought just because he was wise, he could have lots of horses, and lots of wives, and have lots of money in his treasury. He ended up incurring a lot of taxes. He was swayed by some of his wives. So go with the law. Don't go with your own human judgment. Don't think you're above Torah. And that's really kind of moral in terms of Solomon. So, Parsha Shelf team, we will see you Saturday. Thank you to everybody who came out for my Bert from my bar mitzvah portion, and we hope you enjoyed the cupcakes. Thank you to my darling, lovely wife, who's my best friend, for getting the cupcakes. Thank you to Rebbitz and Christy, Rebbitz and Rachel, as I like to call her, her Hebrew name. And Shabbat Shalom to all of you. We'll see you soon.